Hi there, my name is Ben Gilbert. I'm a PhD student with uh, Zan Luthi Schulten at the University of Illinois. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about the work that we've been doing on modeling chromosome replication and segregation in JCVI SYN 3A. Um, so to quickly just provide some background, which hopefully isn't needed after Zane's presentation at this point, but our group works on whole cell modeling. Um, and so we combine lots of heterogeneous data from all these different experiments to parameterize a whole cell model that then predicts time dependent cell states. So my role in this work is to help provide the actual structure of the cell for our spatially resolved simulations. So in previous work, uh, what we did is we began with cryo-electron tomograms from the lab of Elizabeth Villa at UCSD, which were um, completed by Vincent Lam. And then using those, I determined the distribution of ribosomes within the cell and the shape of the membrane. I then created a lattice model of the circular bacterial chromosome and folded it into place around the ribosomes that were measured in the cryo-ET. And then finally, I looked at the organization of this in silico chromosome model and compared it to chromosome organization that was um, looked at experimentally using 3C-seq by Fanamazar Rashid at the lab of Remus Dame in Leiden University. Um, so now moving forward, there were some drawbacks with the lattice model. And so now I'm creating a continuum model of the chromosome of sin 3 a And so in the continuum model, this 543 kilobase pair circular chromosome is modeled as around 54,000 beads on a string, where these beads are DNA monomers that each contain 10 base pairs of DNA and are 3.4 nanometers across. Um, so with this now continuum model, we again begin with the ribosomes that were measured in the cryo-electron tomograms with that distribution, which we have for both the small cell, which has a radius of approximately 200 nanometers, and for a large cell with a radius of approximately 250 nanometers. And I then developed a method to fold the circular continuum model of the chromosome around these ribosomes, which were placed as um, spherical particles. And this method folds the chromosome such that's organized as what is known as a fractal globule, uh, which is uh, kind of the characteristic of um, property of these is that the like regions of the chromosome that are close to each other genomically are clustered together. And that's why you see the groupings of the different colors in the example chromosome. And then we validated this by calculating in silico contact maps and looking at the uh, power law fit to the contact probability. And this also works for the large cell, which can be seen here with the exact same results. Next, getting to the actual twistable polymer model, which is how we describe how these DNA monomers along the length of the chromosome interact with one another. What we have in this case is there is a bending potential which describes the linear stiffness of the polymer, uh, which is usually understood by the persistence length of DNA. And then there's additionally twisting potentials which describe how the beads twist with relation to each other. Um, and so that characterizes the torsional stiffness of DNA, which leads to things like supercoiling. And then finally, there's a stretching energy that um, models the tensile stiffness of DNA. And finally, in addition to these, there are excluded volume interactions between both the DNA and other DNA monomers, the DNA and ribosomes and ribosomes and ribosomes. And that prevents um, strands from crossing one another so that you can actually get uh, supercoiled plectinemic like structures. So then now that we have the polymer model, it's actually simulated using a rigid body Brownian dynamics integrator and lamps. Um, and here are the parameters of the simulations. A particular note are the ones that I've highlighted here, which are the parameters describing the actual um, energy functions in for the DNA. And so all of these parameters were fit based on experimental measurements of DNA's physical properties. So now moving forward to just a quick result from this chromosome model, um, after simulating it, what I found was that the DNA monomers obey nearly normal diffusion um, throughout the cell, while the ribosomes diffuse in a, in a subdiffusive manner. And this is true for all radial distances. So I um, calculated the anomalous diffusion coefficient alpha uh, in different concentric shells within the cell, and that's what I found. Um, and so I'm still in the process of investigating why this is the case and to see how we might explain this. So now moving on to the next part of my talk, discussing chromosome replication and segregation, I'd first like to outline some of the challenges that are associated with that. So firstly, we have to address how do we represent the chromosomes in non-trivial replication states? 
In other words, these nested theta structures, such as what Zane showed in his earlier talk. Next, how are the double stranded DNA strands of the daughter chromosomes actually added to the system? And then finally, how do the daughter chromosomes segregate whilst they are being replicated from the mother? So addressing this first challenge with these non-trivial replication states, I'd first off like to define this term chromosome replication complexity as the ratio of the most replicated region to the least replicated region. So for most common cases in bacteria, this is just the ratio of the number of origins to the number of termini, and this is around 3.3 or 3.4 for SYN3A. And so my solution to addressing these non-trivial replication states was to represent the topology using binary trees. Um, so here's an example of replication state on the left where we see that's a system with three origins highlighted in green, four forks highlighted in blue, and one tur highlighted in orange. And the diagrammatic representation of that is on the right, which corresponds to this structure. And so the underlying assumptions are just that the replication forks of daughter cannot proceed past the replication forks creating their mother. And then additionally, we can look at the total genome content um, and kind of frame everything with respect to that. So on the right is, a, is an additional diagram depicting how we have an understanding of where exactly these daughter chromosomes are attached to one another. Um, so the next challenge to address is how the daughter chromosomes are actually created. Um, so there are a few different proposed models of how replication occurs in bacteria. One of them is this replication factory model where the repl zones are localized and the mother chromosome is pulled through this replication factory while the daughter chromosomes are extruded out the other side of the replication factory. Um, and then another model is the train track model where the repl zones and the replication forks follow along the path of the mother chromosome and produce the daughters as they fall along that path. Um, so in our case, we chose to use the train track model because there's some experimental evidence for this being the case. And in addition, uh, this being the minimal cell, it requires the minimal set of underlying assumptions. There isn't, we don't have to assume that there is some additional protein system that's actually localizing the repl zones, in the like in the case of the replication factory. Um, so here's an example of DNA replication in my chromosome model using um, the train track model. So beginning on the left, we have this mother chromosome um, that's been folded around a ribosome distribution and up near two o'clock is the origin highlighted with a red bead. Uh, and then as we go to the right, 20,000 base pairs of DNA are replicated, which corresponds to 2000 monomers. And you can see that now at two o'clock, there are two origins and they're connected to the two strands of the daughter chromosomes. One is in yellow and one is in teal. And then we can see that the replication forks followed along the path of the mother. And one is now at around six o'clock, nine o'clock, excuse me, and it's kind of deep within the cell. And the other replication fork is at three o'clock highlighted in purple. So finally, the last challenge is how we actually segregate the chromosomes now that we're using this train track model. Because well, we're able to replicate it, what we ultimately want at the end is something like this, where we have a single cell, that has two chromosomes in it that are kind of evenly separated in space. And there's a clear place for the cell to divide into two daughter cells that each contain one uh, fully replicated chromosome. So the proposed solution to that that we're pursuing currently is uh, disentangling the daughter chromosomes via the actions of SMC protein complexes to loop the DNA. And then the subsequent action of topoisomerases to decatenate uh, linked double-stranded DNA. And here's just a schematic depicting how that uh, is proposed to occur. And so just to provide some background quickly on SMC protein complexes, they're ubiquitous in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes, and they consist of this dimer with these two hinge domains that connect. And then at the other end are the head domains where we have uh, chitin glycine proteins. So in the case of SYN3A, SYN3A has the SMC SCP AB complex, which is formed from one SMC, or two SMCs, excuse me, one SCPA and two SCPBs. Um, and so in the 2019 work by Breuer et al, what they found was that all three of these genes are essential, and they additionally figured out the uh, proteomics counts of these genes, which are listed here. So knowing that, um, what we then need to understand is the actual action of this loop extrusion. And so there are some wonderful experiments experiments by Case Decker to characterize the speed of loop extrusion um, as a function of relative DNA extension and then also as a function of the applied force where they tethered DNA and then added SMC proteins to the system and then fluorescently observed the DNA being extruded, which can be seen at the top of this slide. 
So given that we have this experimental data on loop extrusion, what we need is a computational model. And fortunately, um, Bernardo and Micheletto came up with this computational model of loop extrusion um, in 2021, where the loops are modeled with harmonic springs and they're extruded by advancing the harmonic spring along the length of the polymer. And it allows for both the um, harmonic springs to move along the same strand of DNA and then also to jump and reach out um, and grab a new strand of DNA in essentially 3D interstrand motion. Um, and so on the right is a depiction of their simulations of this loop extrusion model. And then in C and D are the actual measurements of how the loop extrusion proceeded. And in D, the comparison to experimental data, that experimental data is actually those uh, measurements that were on the previous slide uh, by Ganji et al. in science. Um, and so finally, I'd like to conclude by just discussing some of my future work that I plan to do. And so firstly, I'd like to investigate distributions of the replication states. Um, so just as a quick example, given that we have some non-trivial replication state in my computational model, I have a way to calculate the contact maps of the daughters. And so you'll notice in this contact map of the daughters, there are these off-diagonal uh, intensities, which represent contacts between sets of daughters. Um, which are not normally resolved in standard 3C methods. Uh, and so then what I am working on is mapping these indistinguishable loci back to what would be observed in 3C because um, they're the same sequence, so there'd be no way in a 3C method of determining that they're from one daughter versus another daughter. So the next I want to come up with a statistical model to help us actually sample from a distribution of replication states because we know based on the qPCR, that the cell is in um, some distribution of states where there are varying extents of replications and varying numbers of forks present. And then finally, to kind of tie it all together, is we want to complete this modeling of cell division because to model the cell cycle, we have to have the cell ultimately divide. Um, and so that's a work in progress right now. Uh, so I'd like to conclude with that, and I'd like to thank the workshop organizers and all of the people on this list, um, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. Very nice, Ben. Thanks. So I'm, I'm, I still wonder, how does the cell? We have, we have the cell division plane with FTSZ and other cell division proteins, and somehow, the SMC complex involved in, in sequestering the daughter chromosomes, has to orient itself on either side, you have to orient two of these on either side of that plane. Yeah, so that's certainly a challenge. So in my in my part of the work um, with the SMC, so when the SMC acts and it loops the DNA like how it's being shown in the schematic, which you can hopefully see uh, in the topoisomerases act, because they form these bundles of DNA um, that are all looped together, they then entropically uh, segregate because of the mm -hmm. excluded volume interactions. And so you'll end up with the daughter chromosome separating. Um, and that's what they've observed like in the work by uh, Gol Baradko down the citation down at the bottom. And so I'd hope hopefully that once they're segregated, perhaps it's the FTSC that identifies that there is a division plane and then begins um, forming the Z ring about that plane because there's some you know mechanical difference um, due to the chromosomes being on either side. So it still suggests that it might be a stochastic process, and yes, that if we had the might the imaging tools, we might see that some fraction of the cells still have are 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 made that end up with, you know, you get no chromosome in one daughter and a and two chromosomes in the other. Yeah, I could I could certainly imagine that being the case. Could you? With your methods, do you think you could predict what that what that fraction would be? Um, so I would think hmm, that would kind of be a long term goal in the full in the full blown spatial model. I think it could feasibly be something that could be done in some kind of well stirred model of the the kinetics mm -hmm. of replication and cell division. I could see you um, doing it in that case, but in the whole cell. In this, in these large-scale simulations, it might be difficult to uh, run a sufficient number of simulations with different enough chromosomes to actually get an idea of the uh, the true um, 
fraction of cells that either fail to divide or successfully divide. Okay. So, or, or or maybe to say, you know, is it is it a tiny number, a, a very tiny number of cells that have two chromosomes, no chromosomes, or is it a, a significant, you know, 10, 20 percent fraction? It seems like it's it would need to be low for the cells to be efficient at at living. And and it may be that there are you know more elements involved in this system than we are aware of. Certainly. Uh, you Other know, questions? John, uh, from uh, uh, Take Your Paws work at, at John Hopkins, uh, you know, Zane was analyzing them because uh, they have three channels. One shows the DNA, one the membrane dye, one the cytoplasm dye. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are very few that are empty. You mm -hmm. know, so yeah, your comment is dead on. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if we can label for Take Hip. Um, some element of the SMC complex with a different floor than FTSZ, for instance. Good idea. <laughs> on on Monday's workshop, um, so Ed Boyden at MIT and George Church at Harvard, mm -hmm. uh, I, they recently got the cell from me, and their plan is to use um, use this cell in expansion microscopy. And so they're going to at least, or George is going to talk a little bit about what their plans are on Monday. So the, these might be questions we pose for them that they may have some better tools than what what we can do with conventional microscopy. But it, you know, tune in on Monday. That's a good teaser. Yes, <laughs> always trying uh, I, to advertise. This, this is Dave Goodsell. Can I ask a quick, quick questions? Sure. Yeah, Ben, great, great work. Um, so you. are you treating the messenger RNA explicitly? No, I'm not treating the messenger RNA um, explicitly in this case. And uh, as it stands, I only have the chromosome and then ribosomes and um, essentially a boundary made of boundary particles. 